everyone. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So glad you're able to join me again this week for a, another Bible study out of Ephesians chapter 6. We're looking at the war and the wardrobe of the believer, the spiritual armor that God has given us. When I was in junior high school, I developed what would eventually become a lifelong interest in the history that surrounded uh, World War II. I'd check out books from the school library on it. it, it I'd watch any movie that had anything to do with World War II. It could be a drama, it could be a musical, it could be a documentary. I just enjoyed reading and studying about those kinds of things. I liked pretty much any World War II era movie except the ones where John Wayne died. Uh, if he died, I don't even want to watch the movie. That just some of you understand what I'm saying when I say that. I know I brought a little bit of concern at at one point because. Um, the school library had a number of books on Adolf Hitler and uh, I checked so many of them out and read them and uh, just was fascinated by this man. He was as evil as you could imagine. But I, it, was, it was intriguing about how this man could influence an entire nation to, to follow him in some of his diabolical plans. Uh, the man was charismatic, uh, an antichrist, uh, no question to me about that. But I, I, I know my mother asked me, why are you reading so much about Hitler? <laughs> so I remember that she was a little bit concerned. But even back in the 90s, uh, I had to go to a, uh, a Caterpillar training uh, school in Phoenix. And my, my boss allowed me to bring along my wife and we brought a a couple of our kids, one couldn't make it, and she stayed with some friends, but we were en route to Phoenix, and some of you maybe have stopped by uh, the General George S. Patton Museum uh, on Interstate 10 there in Southern California. We needed to get out and rest a little bit and kind of stretch our legs, and so we pulled over there to get some refreshments and wind up spending a good deal of time, more time than we had planned, just walking through that museum, looking at all the paraphernalia, watching all the little documentary films, reading everything I could have time to read. Still wasn't done by the time we were finished, but while I was there, I came across a book uh, that, that had been written by a man who served with General Patton. Uh, he was, General Patton was not very popular uh, with a lot of Washington bureaucrats, um, but there was one thing you have to admit about Patton, if you know anything about him at all, and is that that man understood warfare. Uh, there was a book that I purchased while I was there called General Patton's Principles for Life and Leadership written by Porter Williamson, a man who had served for years under General Patton's leadership. And he wrote down all these principles that General Patton had for, for leading. And one of the things that caught my attention was one of the chapters was, was on keeping your feet clean. Uh, during the during the Battle of the Bulge, uh, Patton saw to it that 100,000 U.S. soldiers were given dry white socks every day. He was noted to say this, it is more important to keep your feet clean than it is to brush your teeth. You don't walk on your teeth. You use your feet all the time to get at the enemy. Keep your feet clean, end quote. You know, that may not sound very strategic, uh, but a person who has suffered from uh, sore feet understands the importance of taking care of your feet. Back when I was young and dumber than I am today, I, I, here again I was working for a Caterpillar dealer back in the, in the early 80s, and uh, I thought I'd save a little bit of money and needed a new pair of work boots. So I've been wearing some pretty pricey work boots uh, back then. A good pair would cost me around 80 bucks. Uh, they're almost twice that now. But uh, I decided to save a little money and we went to Surplus City. Uh, some of you remember Surplus City and Discount Place. And I bought a pair of boots. I think the, the brand was, was Gorilla. They were, that was the brand, it was a Gorilla brand. And I bought these little lace up work boots and I wore them to work the next day. And by noon, I understood why they were called Gorilla because I was literally walking like a gorilla. My feet were hurting so bad. They were rubbing the bone on my ankle. I wound up before the end of the day taking red shop towels and duct tape 
and wrapping around my ankles and then lacing the boot up just to protect my ankles. I threw those things away. You get what you pay for. You have gotta take care of your feet. Now, one of the tactics that was used in warfare during Paul's day, as we get into this text, was they would, they would plant these razor sharp sticks just below the surface of the ground so that an army marching towards you might be injured uh, in their feet and become unable to fight efficiently. That was a, a, a one of the strategies that armies would use. And so they the, the Romans, at least, had these shoes that they had fashioned that were very, very tough. They could march through hot roads, climb over rocks and jagged mountains and trample over thorns and, and, and wade through streams and all of that stuff. And they wanted their feet to be as protected as they could because a soldier who does not have a good, uh, good standing is going to be easy prey. He won't even be able to retreat should the order be given to retreat. A soldier whose feet's blistered, cut, swollen, or whatever can't fight very well, um, he's going to get into a very perilous situation. Now, in addition to being made, made of this, this tough, durable uh, leather to protect his feet, the Roman soldier's shoes or boots would, were usually impregnated with bits of metal and glass to give them good traction. They, they wouldn't be slipping around on any terrain. Uh, gave them a great deal of stability in fighting. Now, the Christian's spiritual footwear is what we're looking at today. And folks, it is equally important in this warfare against the schemes of the devil to put on not just the breastplate of righteous, not just to have our loins girt about with truth, but we need to have our feet properly shod with the shoes of the gospel of peace. The preparation of the gospel of peace is what Paul calls it there in that verse. Now, the gospel of peace, what is that? There have been some that have seen that and they've said, well, this is evangelism. And they'll reference you back to uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 15, the latter part of verses, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And they say, well, the, the preparation uh, of the, the, the shoes of the gospel of peace, that's referring to evangelism. Uh, folks, I, I really don't think that's the best way to interpret this. Um, in Ephesians, the term isn't talking about going anywhere. It's not talking about preaching anything. This doesn't seem to be what the Apostle Paul has in mind. In this context, the spiritual warfare, the weapons of our warfare, Paul said, listen, the, the, it's not about preaching or going somewhere. It's about standing, isn't it? I mean, in verse 11, that you might be able to stand. Verse 13, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Verse 14, stand, therefore. So I think it's best to understand that this gospel of peace isn't referring to evangelism. It's referring to something else. And I think uh, where we should go and just get, get an understanding of this is go back to Romans chapter 5. Hold your place in Ephesians 6 and turn in your Bibles back to Ephesians, or excuse me, Romans chapter 5. Now, we're going to look at verses 5 down through 10. We're just going to read those. And they what they do is they give us a good description of man's condition without God in his life. Look at verse 6. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely, for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having been now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, how much more, having been reconciled, we shall we be saved by his life. I mean, just think about the description given to us. In verse 6, we're without strength. In verse 7, it says essentially that we were unrighteous. 
Verse 9, we're unjust, we're unsaved, we're the objects of his wrath. And verse 10, we're enemies. We were once enemies with God. But now look at verse 1. Back up to the top of Romans chapter 5, look at verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's some wonderful news because part of the verses we read said that we were enemies with God, but verse 1 really sets the stage for the great news is that because of our faith in Christ, we have been justified, we have been forgiven, and now peace has been established between us and God who were once at enmity with each other. There's a great cross-reference. If you're there in Romans 5, make you a little note by the chapter heading to look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 to 17, and then find your way back to Ephesians and look at this passage. Beginning in verse 14, For he himself, that is Jesus, is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so that to create in himself one new man from the two thus making peace and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross thereby putting to death the enmity and he came and he preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near essentially what Paul is saying is there were Jews, there were Gentiles, there, there were, they weren't together. They were not together. They were, even in the temple, there was a section for the Gentiles, there was a section for the Jews. There was a middle wall of partition that separated the two, but in Christ, he has made the two one. There was neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. So he's saying that middle wall of partition broke down. So he, he abolished the enmity between the Jews and the Gentiles. But he goes further than that, and he says he reconciled. He made peace between both of them to God. Both of us, Jews and Gentiles alike, now can have a relationship with God. We're no longer his enemies. And that's what he means in verse 17 when he says, He came and preached peace to you that were afar off. In other words, the Gentiles and to those of you who were near, the Jews. You see, God has reconciled to himself through the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, both camps. And now we are one in Christ Jesus. No longer are our sins separating us from an infinite holy God. Now, here's the point. The gospel of peace is the marvelous truth that in Christ we are now at peace with God and are one with Him. When our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, we can stand in absolute confidence of God's love for us, His union with us, and His commitment to fight for us. Now, why is this so important? Because, listen, if our commander-in-chief were in question, if he who called us to be soldiers, as it says in 2 Timothy, if he who called us to be soldiers was, was a flake, and one day we're okay with him and the other day he's mad because we, we had a particularly bad sinful day, and so he's, we're constantly in his graces and sometimes we're out of his graces. If that were the case, we would have absolutely no confidence to face the enemy because it would, we'd never know whose camp we really belong to. If God were to say, you know what, Frank, I am so tired of you messing up you seem like you always fail me. I'm just going to turn you back over and let you fight the, on the other side. Now we're enemies again. If God were to say that, I'd have nothing to stand on. I, I couldn't fight. There's no stability there. The, the, the preparation, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, is standing firmly in the confidence that once I'm God's, I am always God's. We now live as believers in the reality 
of what Paul said in Colossians chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. If you want to turn back there or look at the screen here, here's what it says. And by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross, and you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. Satan is the original destroyer of peace, isn't he? First with a third of the angels, then with Adam and Eve, and folks, he still seeks to destroy the believers today. He tries to attack us with doubts about our relationship with God, about the settled peace that was made by the cross, by the blood of Jesus Christ. That can't be undone. When you come to Christ and his blood covered your sin, washed away your sin, that can't be undone. You need to sell it in your heart. Because listen, one of Satan's chief strategies against God's people is to get them to not trust the relationship they have with him. He wants us to live with guilt and doubt and worry. He doesn't want us to walk in confident trust that everything is truly good between God and us. Listen, Paul in Romans 7 talked about a war that we have going on within us. Paul said in Romans 7, the things I, I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. You can relate to that struggle inside. I don't want to live poorly. I don't want to, to live unrighteously. I want to have that breastplate of righteousness on, Christ's righteousness attributed to me, and then I want to live out what Christ has done. But in all honesty, and you will say this too, I don't do that consistently. I find a lot of cracks, if you will, in my chinks in my armor. Like Paul says, hey, look, I, I want to do the right thing, but I don't always find myself doing it. And then he says this, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Then he goes on to say this, I thank God through Jesus Christ who gives us the victory and then Romans 8, 1, you can quote this with me. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ. What Satan comes along and does, he says, look, look how bad you blew it. Look at those thoughts you had. Do you remember you gossiped today? You remember the, the foul language you used? You remember how you lost your temper with the, the children or how you, you, you told a fib? And, and he brings all of this stuff. And what he wants you to do is shake you from the foundation. You know what? God is so disappointed in you. He is called the accuser of the brethren for a reason. He just wants to infiltrate our minds and to shake us from the confidence that we can have in our relationship with God. If he can undermine that, he can knock you off balance completely every single time he advances. You need to understand the gospel of peace is that God, through the blood of Jesus Christ, has made peace you are no longer at enmity or enemies of God. You now are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you're of the household of God. That's what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2. You can see people, wonderful illustrations of people in the Old Testament, even in the New, who walked with a confidence in their relationship with God. You see it in, in that story of David who goes against Goliath. Everybody else is fearful, but he says, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he took care of business. There's a young man who understood, God's with me. He hasn't forsaken me. He's never left me. Elijah, facing the 450 prophets of Baal, stood boldly against that. Understood, God's on my side. Even in the New Testament, when Peter and John stood before the Sanhedrin speaking boldly uh, about Jesus, and Peter tells the Sanhedrin, hey, whether it's right in the sight of God to, to listen to you more than God, you judge. For we cannot help but speak of the things that we have both seen 
and heard. Man, these men were bold. They were courageous because they understood where they stood with God. Do you understand where you stand with God? If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you stand in the enemy's camp. But if you know Christ, if you've trusted Christ, his death on the cross, then you have a firm and solid foundation to stand on. Your hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness, right? The believer who stands in the Lord's power need not fear the enemy, even Satan himself. When he comes to attack us, our feet are rooted firmly on the solid ground of the gospel of peace. He can't knock that away from me. I belong to God, and yes, I fail. And yes, I don't always live out my life with sincerity. There are some cracks in me sometimes, if you will. Sometimes I struggle with truthfulness and hypocrisy. Oh, I hate that about me. There are those times where I don't live righteously like I want to. But one thing I know that is unalterable, and that is that the peace that has been established because of the cross is firm, it's fixed, and I will not be moved from that truth. Because sometimes that's what I've got to hold on to, because God, all of the accusations, if Satan were bringing them against me today are true. I did lose my temper. I did say that thing. I did do that thing. I, I did treat that person that way. And God says, you're still my son. Repent of those things, but you're still mine. The relationship hasn't dissolved because of your inconsistency, Frank. What a joy. What You have to have that in you. I have talked to so many people over the years who just live with guilt that God, I don't see how God can love me. He just can't love me anymore. And, and folks, that's true. God cannot love you more than he does right now, and he can't love you less. His love is a constant. Folks, we who were once enemies are now his children. And our Heavenly Father offers us his full resources to be strong in him and in the power of his might. It's a great related idea. If you're in Ephesians 6, just put you a little note in the margin of your Bible. Make like a little cross-reference to Psalm chapter 121. You're going to love this passage. You're going to want these two verses to connect. Psalm 121, verse 2 and 3. Look at this. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Chapter 55, verse 22. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. You know, folks, when you have Jesus, when you're clothed in Christ, do you understand that you have everything you need to live this life victoriously for God? I appreciate what James Proctor wrote. He said this, quote, I've tried in vain a thousand ways my fears to quell, my hopes to raise. But what I need, the Bible says, is ever only Jesus. How do you prepare to stand in the shoes of the gospel of peace? What will help you withstand in that evil day that Paul mentioned? I'm going to suggest very quickly several things. The first one is a give me. You need to meet the author of peace. You see, peace has been established, but it is only those who appropriate it by faith that it means anything to. If you don't have a relationship with the Prince of Peace, as he's called in Isaiah 9, with the God of Peace, as he's called in Hebrews 13, with the Lord of Peace that he's called in 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you don't have a relationship with the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Peace, the God of Peace, then peace has not been established between you and God. You're still at enmity. So the first 
way to stand victoriously is you need to meet the author of peace, the one who made it possible. Secondly, you need to begin to meditate. Now that you're a believer, you need to meditate on the Prince of Peace. The Bible says in, in Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So learn to get your mind on Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Consider Christ in every way. Thirdly, manifest the spirit of peace. Manifest the spirit of peace. Once you know the God of peace, the Prince of Peace, and you meditate on him, he's, he's, he's in your mind all of the time then your spirit needs to manifest that peace. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace. That means you're a person who lives not only with peace, but you're a person who, who creates peace between other people. You live at peace as much as it lies within you, Paul said. Live at peace with all men. But you need to also memorize and meditate on the word of peace. Psalm 119, verse 165, those who love your law have great peace and nothing causes them to stumble. Folks, here is a truth that you need to let sink in. You cannot have the peace of God until you first of all come to know the God of peace. You need him. You want victory in your life today. You want this armor that God has made available to you to make a difference. Then let me ask you something. Are you firmly committed to God's word as, the, as, as absolute truth? Is it the final authority for your faith and your conduct? Do you place God's word in high esteem? It's where you go to. What it says, you believe and you live by. Is that you? Then, not only are you committed to the truth of God's word, but are then are you a person who's committed to living truthfully? The belt of truth means that you live in sincerity, without hypocrisy. Are you committed to being a person who walks in the truth, honest with others, and certainly honest with yourself. And then you need to ask yourself this, do I live a holy life? Do I have on the breastplate of righteousness? Am, am, I, am I living out in practical terms what Christ has imputed to my account, his perfect righteousness? To use Paul's words out of Ephesians 4, are you walking worthy of the calling where, with which you are called? Are you living up to what the Lord has put in you? That's the breastplate of righteousness. And then you need to ask yourself another question. Am I standing firm in the battle because my feet are rooted and grounded in my relationship with God? Is if Satan can knock you off, he isn't going to knock you off, off balance with this. God is not happy with you right now. He loves you less right now because of your behavior. And he'll knock you up. You have to be solid. Listen, it's not that you find excuse for your sin because you don't need to. You need to be living a righteous life as much as, much as you can. Yeah, you're going to struggle like Paul did, like I do, like everybody else does who wants to live for Jesus and honor him. But there are going to be those times where you fail. It's inevitable. And when it happens... You need to make sure that you're rooted firmly and, and, and strongly in the truth that no matter what I do, God's love doesn't vacillate. His care for me doesn't wane. He's not capricious. He loves me with an everlasting love. And I have to hold on to that because I'm not always very lovely. <laughs> that was an understatement. But I know in whom I believe. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Because of, because of what he's done for me, I'm not going to be moved. It's like the, the psalmist writes in Psalm 18, verse 
33 through 36. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He sets me on my high places. He teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend the bow of bronze. You also have given me the shield of your salvation. Your right hand has held me up. Your gentleness has made me great. You enlarged my path under me so my feet did not slip. Folks, the spirit-filled believer who is fully clad in God's armor can sing confidently with, with John Newton, the same man who wrote Amazing Grace, wrote these words, and I'll conclude with this. Look at the words to this old hymn. Though many foes beset you around, and feeble is your arm, your life is hid with Christ in God, beyond the realm of harm. Weak as you are, you shall not fade, or fainting shall not die. Jesus, the strength of every saint, will aid you from on high. Though unperceived by mortal sense, faith sees him always near, a guide, a glory, a defense. What have you to fear? As surely as he overcame and triumphed once for you, so surely you that love his name shall in him triumph too. Isn't that good? Let the truth of John Newton's words sink into your heart. Stand firm that peace has been established, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. God made peace, and forever it will stand. He will not break his peace with you. And that's great news. Thank you for joining me today. Have a good and godly week. May the Lord bless you. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.